With the radiative model out of the way, let's turn our attention to a model that describes how the Earth's climate system actually works, the thermal model. This video is shorter, and I'll do it in one section. To do that, we need to focus on heat, not radiation. I have a separate presentation on heat and temperature, but it's important to realize that long wave radiation is not heat. Temperature is the speed at which atoms and molecules are moving. Heat is the number of atoms or molecules moving at the same speed. One molecule zipping through space can be very hot, but have almost no heat. Two tons of hot iron has twice the heat of one ton of iron at the same temperature. Photons don't have any heat, even if they are in the infrared, because photons aren't atoms. Here's an infrared photograph. You can't see the heat directly. You can see the infrared photons everything generates. Infrared photons transport energy, not heat. So there's no heat until these photons transfer their energy into molecules or atoms and increase their speed. And that's how you feel heat from a fire. The Earth receives about 120 petawatts at all times, so it has to find a way to get rid of 120 petawatts, and it does that by moving heat. Heat is always moves from hot to cold, and that's what drives our Earth's climate system. We'll understand it using four gradients, three of which we can see here. The first gradient is the vertical lapse rate. Almost all the heat in the atmosphere is down in the troposphere, which has the negative lapse rate we're familiar with. Most photons that hit the land escape to space in the upper atmosphere, as we learned in a previous video. The next gradient is the rotational gradient from day to night and back. The air doesn't interact with the photons, they pass right through. Without greenhouse gases, the Earth's atmosphere would not heat up. It would be very hot on the sunny side and very cold on the dark side, as the moon is. Remember that the greenhouse effect takes place in seconds, so if you just look at radiation, you would say the Earth would be hottest at noon and coldest all night long when there's no incoming radiation. And that's not what happens. The surface and the air are hottest around 5 p.m. We don't experience peak temperature at the time of peak radiation because the atmosphere and pressure systems build up heat during the afternoon and don't release it until after the sun begins to set. During an inversion or heat dome event, the radiation doesn't change, but the pressure does, and that changes the surface temperature significantly. This shows that the radiative model is unhelpful and the thermal model is a better match. Now let's look at the meridional temperature gradient, which is the change in temperature from the tropics to the poles. We generally define the tropics as 30 degrees north and south of the equator and the temperate zones from 30 to 60 degrees. The tropics cover half the Earth's surface area, but this area absorbs two thirds of the energy coming to the Earth from the sun. This is because outside the tropics, the angle of the sun is spread over a larger distance, plus the sun's energy has to come through more atmosphere. The oceans absorb about 60 petawatts of energy at all times and transport roughly 11 pet petawatts away from the tropics to the poles. That's about 20% of the energy coming into the tropics. So if we widen this area to 40 degrees, we have a net energy surplus from 40 degrees south to 40 degrees north. So more heat enters here than leaves to space. A significant amount of energy goes mostly into the oceans and heats the water. That water first goes west because the Earth is spinning east. And when it gets to land, it turns toward the poles. You can see right here that at the eastern point of South America, it's just south of the equator, which sends more heat north to the Antarctic and less heat south to the Antarctic. This is just one feature of many that influences heat transport and invalidates the radiative model. From 40 to 60 degrees, the surface and atmosphere are roughly in equilibrium. This is the temperate zone where most of the weather is. The warm water interacts with cooler air and causes storms, hurricanes, and chaotic air movement that carries heat from the tropics to the polar regions. Beyond 60 degrees, more heat escapes the system than enters. The heat is transported to the poles about two-thirds via air currents and one-third via ocean currents. When ice melts during summer, it's the climate system storing heat, like a battery. 
When the polar summer ends, that heat is then released as ice forms. It goes up through the polar vortex and gets emitted by greenhouse gas molecules at the top, completing the circuit from the equator to the poles and out to space. I want to drive this home. It takes a lot of energy to melt ice. Each summer, starting in March, sunlight melts an area the size of the United States that is two meters thick in the Arctic. When ice melts in the Arctic all summer long, that's not a heat wave. That's the Earth's way of storing energy. When the water freezes six months later, it releases that energy, which goes up through the low pressure zone in the polar vortex to space via long wave photons. More melting ice doesn't mean more radiation. It means more heat has traveled from the tropics to be released the following winter. About 20% of the energy coming into the oceans gets transported from the tropics to the poles where heat is eventually turned into infrared radiation and sent to space. Along the way, it converts between heat and infrared energy many times as it follows the temperature gradient from the tropics to the poles. These gradients drive the Earth's climate. And here's how we visualize them. The temperature at the equator is in the center and the South Pole is on the left and North Pole on the right. The planet is turned 90 degrees to match. During the Cretaceous period, 100 million years ago, the temperature gradient was fairly flat. Most of the Earth was very warm, continents were concentrated near the equator, and there were few storms. It wasn't as easy to move heat to the poles, so this Earth is very hot and very humid. And this is snowball Earth, which may have occurred about 750 million and 440 million years ago. It would have been caused by a combination of low eccentricity, the arrangement of the continents, and feedbacks. At its coldest, the temperature at the equator might have been below freezing, and there may even have been some solid CO2 at the poles, also called dry ice, because the poles were much colder than today, and look how steep that gradient is. Scary. The distance from the Earth to the Sun, along with the shapes of the continents, gives us the meridional temperature gradient we have now, which is the blue line. Average Earth temperature is around 14.3 degrees, and there is ice at the poles year-round, so we're in an ice age right now. The shape of this curve determines the Earth's climate. This diagram from Javier Vinos's book shows the energy distribution by latitude. The light blue dotted line represents incoming energy from the sun, with the equator in the center and the south pole to the left, north pole to the right. Note the blocking of sunlight at the equator due to clouds. That's a little dip here in the blue line. There's a heat surplus inside of 40 degrees. That's, that's the red area, and a net loss of heat at the poles, shown by the blue shaded areas. This data shows that the radiative model is invalid, and the climate system moves quite a bit of heat from the tropics to the poles. Now I'll build a simple but realistic energy budget. About 29% of incoming energy is reflected off clouds, land, and water back to space. That's called the albedo. About 3% is absorbed by ozone, higher up in the stratosphere, and full 20% is absorbed by the atmosphere. That leaves 48% going to the surface. About 17% is absorbed by the land, and makes its way back out to space via convection, conduction, and radiation, and as we have seen. About 31%, twice as much energy, goes into the oceans. Now, half of that energy evaporates water and goes up, and is eventually lost to space, as we have seen. The other half, though, penetrates and heats the water, and that heat gets transported poleward. There's one final temperature gradient, and that's the thermocline going down into the oceans. The thermocline is largely driven by salinity, since saltier water is heavier. In the North Atlantic Ocean, the formation of ice sends tons of salty water down to the bottom of the ocean to return back south. Did you know that all sea ice is essentially fresh water? Because of this sinking water, the Earth can be out of radiative balance as excess heat can go down into the oceans and stay there for hundreds of years and it can come back out over decades or centuries as the gradients allow. This is part of the Global Ocean Conveyor Belt, which connects four of the world's five oceans in a current that is driven by temperature and salinity. It takes a given water parcel about a thousand years to complete its journey around the Earth, 
So sunlight can go into the ocean and that heat can stay in the ocean for hundreds and hundreds of years before finally coming back out and going to space. You don't see that in the radiative model, but you do see it if you study pressure systems, ocean currents, and oscillations. This is an important slide from Javier Vinos. It shows detrended data, which is just the relative ups and downs. At the top is the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, a 65-year cycle that's going to turn negative in just a few years. In the middle is the Pacific decadal oscillation, which has a very strong correlation to temperature. This tells us that ocean oscillations play a very important role in our climate system. This is an assembly of most of the main temperature series that try to show how CO2 is driving temperature. Look at that hockey stick shape. But even here, the fit with the AMO and the PDO graphs is better than with CO2. You can see the temperature goes up, down, it goes back up, then down, then up. It's flat for about 15 years or so, and then back up again. This corresponds more to the solar cycles and ocean oscillations than it does to CO2. It's even more pronounced if you remove the urban stations that are heated by humans. Here the blue dashed line shows data from rural stations that haven't been compromised. This line shows the very cold years that occurred three years after the Krakatoa volcano erupted in 1883. Despite the volcano, rural stations generally show warmer temperatures in the past and milder temperatures in the last few decades, which is the opposite of the graphs you see on social media now. That's because CO2 is not the driver. On the order of hundreds and thousands of years, temperature trends are mostly driven by sunspot cycles, which drive more or less energy into the oceans. There's a 2,500 year cycle called the Bray cycle, and another thousand year cycle called the Eddy cycle. And see how they both were at their minimum 400 years ago? to cause the Little Ice Age, and two more times before that caused cold periods that ended flourishing civilizations. The end of the Bronze Age was particularly brutal. You do not want to have been born at the end of the Bronze Age. We can predict from this that the next double low point will be around the year 2450, when it may be again possible to ice skate on the Thames River, no matter how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. To sum this up, we have two main drivers of climate at all time scales. Momentum drives the orbits of planets around the sun. It almost certainly drives sunspots. Momentum drives the continents into different configurations, which drives ocean currents and their oscillations. We can predict certain cycles better than others, and there's plenty of variability and complexity both within cycles and from one cycle to the next. Almost nothing repletes perfectly because there are too many things in motion and they all influence it, each other. And on the other hand, we have chaotic mixing and stochastic events that can't be predicted. For example, when two or more cyclic events happen, the result is a chaotic phenomenon like the Maunder minimum. And many phenomena are in a buildup and release cycle where something has to reach a threshold to trigger an event. This creates lightning strikes, the El Nino, earthquakes, sudden stratospheric warming, volcanoes, etc. Then there are things we still don't understand like cloud formation and precipitation. Some of these are quasi-cyclic, and some are simply unpredictable. So let me quickly summarize now. In the radiative model, greenhouse gas molecules are necessary to heat the air, and the more of them there are, the more air they heat. In the thermal model, greenhouse gases are necessary to heat the air, but CO2 is already working to convert energy to heat, and the heat back to energy, and it has plenty of capacity to do so. More CO2 has no effect on temperature because we already have the minimum amount needed, which is about 100 parts per million. On the other hand, more water vapor does contribute to overnight temperatures, but is dwarfed by the thermal effects of pressure systems during the day. That is the basic thermal model, though there's of course much more to it, now we'll look at how well the thermal model answers questions the radiative model can't.